Hi, my name is Sangeeta Kaur. Otherwise, some people may know me as Teresa Mai. I'm a singer, songwriter, producer, recently Grammy nominated singer. Um, I'm also a meditator and lover of yoga and spirituality. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over the world. Thank you. Um, first off, congratulations on the Grammy nomination. That's uh, amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What does it mean to be Vietnamese to you? Hmm. I feel like that this question and this answer changes as the years go by. Um, and today, what it feels to be Vietnamese to me is, you know, and I've said this very recently, um, I feel like it's a blessing and an absolute miracle. Um, <laughs> and it's a very touching question for me and even more recently in my life. I just think back, you know, there were so many people who tried to have a better life and there was a percentage that actually made it. And because of that, I'm here because of my parents, because of all that they've done and that they've gone through an experience that I would never be able to really understand. All that I do understand is that because of them, their courage, um, their fearlessness, um, I have this opportunity to have this life as a Vietnamese American woman and to hold on to this beautiful culture and heritage that we that we share. Um, it's just such a blessing. I, I love our heritage. I love our people. I love um, the traditions that we that we have. And um, and they're so strong, you know, it's um, it's just a true blessing to be to be Vietnamese. Did you have this insight as you were growing up? Or? Yeah, it's definitely changing. And I'm sure my feelings and my connection to it is going to continue to change as I grow older. Um, but growing up, uh, no, I just lived it. I was just <clears throat> sort of in it. And, and you know, I have a huge family and I just sort of, we were oblivious of how we even got here, why we even are here, what our uncles and aunts and everybody actually went through. I remember going to the airport and picking up a whole batch of other family members. And it was just, oh, more cousins, more uncles, more aunts. <laughs> but it wasn't something that, you know, as a child, they spoke about with uh, my brother and I. So no, it was just more, I'm just living my normal life. And as I got older, I think hearing a little bit um, more and more stories revealed to us, um, personal stories from my family, then I, it started to imprint in my mind more and more. And now I think as an adult, um, it just, it's like a total reveal, you know, and that's why I feel it's such a, a blessing to even be alive and to be here. You're one of the few um, artists that I know that grew up in Orange County, but left Orange County to become part of the mainstream, if you would even call it that. How do you think yeah. that that journey became so? I honestly feel like when we are born into this life, into this body, that there's a lot of things and, you know, not everyone may um, believe this or feel this way, but personally for me, I just feel when we were born into this world, there was some there, many things that we chose, actually. We chose certain paths for ourselves because there's certain things that we wanted to work out on a spiritual level, on a soul level. And so even though at a young age, I didn't understand that, that was never a concept in my mind. It was something that became more and more real as life went by and as more experiences happened for me. But I come to realize that music all of these things in my life, um, how I left and everything was sort of perfection. It was like something that I felt in my heart that I had to do, something that felt right. And I think I was blessed enough to have the sense of this really strong intuition 
and also my parents gave me this really strong stubbornness <laughs> as well. I inherited this stubbornness and it, it served me well because um, I don't know, every time I made those moves, it was something that I felt really strongly about. And there was nothing that was gonna stop me from doing it. And it, it could have looked horrible when I was younger and I wasn't a good child or whatnot, but it was just something I knew in my heart that I that I wanted to do and that it was just sort of following this calling, I guess, you know. Does your family come from a, an art background? You know, um, no one really went into the field of art or music, but there's definitely a lot of talent in the family. Um, you know, and I, and I think about that a lot. Like I have one cousin who um, I don't, you, you probably do know Asia, the production company. So he's been, he's, you know, been singing with them for years. His name is Mike Hanson. And so he's probably the only um, blood related relative that is actually out there doing something in the arts. But my family in general, like there are some people who are so talented, whether that be in music or visual arts. Um, and I, and I realized, you know, it, it was that generational gap. It was this um, generation that sort of lost that opportunity just because, you know, we came from parents that were refugees. And so sort of, um, that wasn't an option. Like if you were talented in the arts or in, in creative, that wasn't an option as a career path, right? For, for very plain out, um, leg, like practical reasons. And so I think a lot of my family members never pursued it because it wasn't the thing that was gonna bring in the money to survive. It wasn't a survival kind of career. And that's why I think my path is just so different. Like I, I almost went down the route of you know, becoming that doctor and, and doing all of those things. I studied biology for quite some time and, and minored in music, but, you know, my heart and mind told me music is your path. This is your, this is your mission in your life. Like there's a gift here and you have to use this for something greater, you know? Um, so it was, again, just that voice in me that I was, I was, not knowing that was constantly speaking to me, but that I was hearing and that I was listening to. How much support did you get from mom? And dad? Um, in the beginning, not that much in the sense that they didn't really believe what I was doing. They kind of thought, oh, my daughter, she's just, she loves to sing and it's a hobby and we'll just let her do it, but she'll, she'll you know, become a doctor or a lawyer or something. So they were not, not supportive, they just, didn't it didn't fathom in their minds that this could actually be a thing and it wasn't until um you know i i finally finished my bachelor's degree in music and my parents came to my recitals and i think it was then that they realized oh my god she really does have a talent maybe this is what she really wants to do and then you know i think they also saw the kind of joy that it brought to people and the feedback that they were getting from their friends and family. And it started to, I think, made them feel proud and really like locked into their minds like, okay, she can, she can really do this. And so they just really allowed that. It, it was, then it eventually became, my parents went to every production, wow. every performance. I mean, you know, my dad lives in Houston now and till this day, he almost hardly misses anything. Like he'll try to come to everything. You know, so now it's such a different, they could never imagine me doing anything else. They would never want that. They see how much joy it brings for me and for all those around us. So, so it's like, it's just, it all worked out. And it always does if we just kind of persevere. And if we, are, if we really live in our heart and listen to our intuition, that's what the universe wants for us. That's what God wants for us. You know, and all of these things that happen in life that make you kind of, feel resistant, it's part of that journey. Resistance is good. It teaches you something. It teaches you to be stronger and be more clear of what, what your path is, you know? What a beautiful story. Um, I remember actually coming to your house and meeting your mother and- your No mother kidding. Oh yes, uh, in the 90s, in the oh 90s. Gosh. 
Yeah, because Joel, uh, your brother, went to high school with, um, well, went to my high school. I, I was a little bit ahead of him. And I remember, um, you know, going over there for lunch uh, with a bunch of our friends and meeting your mom. And I don't think you were around at the time. But when I think back on that, um, that was like probably 30 years ago, um, close to 30, 28, 29 years ago. I, I see how far you have traveled in your journey because, uh, you know, Orange County is not, you know, um, typically a place where, you know, mainstream music artist types come from. Uh, it's, yeah. it's a very community uh, heavy with our, our Vietnamese culture. So I remember it very clearly. And I want to commend how far you've come because I, I know, I, I just know where you come from. And it's, it's a yeah. beautiful thing to hear. It's so crazy. I can't even believe that that you've you've gone back that far with our friends and my brother. And I mean, it's it's kind of unreal. But you know, when I think back of those years, because you know, we actually um, grew up in Los Angeles, so we were. And this is like a whole other topic, but it was such a drastic change for us to move from Los Angeles to Orange County. So we were in Los Angeles for you know, I was in kindergarten until like junior high until we finally moved to Orange County. And I just remembered, you know, we're so young, we're so innocent, we're not thinking about anything else, but our friends that are in front of us, and we just sort of share moments. And, you know, growing up in Los Angeles, I remember we both my brother and I had friends that were all ethnicities. And this was like a very normal thing. And then I, I remember moving to Orange County. And it was you know, you, you'll recall it was during the years that it wasn't so bright and fluffy and sweet and beautiful at the, in those, in the nineties. And so I kind of had this crazy shock moving to Orange County at the time, because, um, I just remembered it was a little bit more, um, separated, like as far as ethnicity, you know, and I remember coming to Orange County and like, all the Asians and Vietnamese were kind of like, okay, you're our friend, you belong to us. And it was like the weirdest, almost like a culture shock for yeah. me. And it was something that one, I think I was kind of having to adapt to. And secondly, it never felt comfortable to me. I just felt like, it's so weird. Why is it that if you're Asian, you can only hang out with Asians. If you're Hispanic, you can only hang out with Hispanic unless otherwise people kind of say things or, it was just the oddest time and it was really hard actually i think it stirred up a lot of um anxiety and fear for me as a as a um, young teen um and it was i mean you remember those days it was a very violent time yeah i was community. just gonna say that uh, the the people that we hung out yeah. with the 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 people that you dated uh the crew that was around that time i remember were you know it, we it was not a safe place i remember um some of the, the the guys that we hung out with it was uh it was a it was a really challenging time for for those teenagers yes absolutely and you know it's um and this is why i think earlier i was saying i feel like i have lived so many different lifetimes within this lifetime because when i think back of my teenage years my junior high years i'm like did all of that really happen was is that even possible because after a decade everyone switched and their mentality shifted yeah. as if during those days it never existed anymore and you know truth be told like we witnessed so much violence it was like the worst like vietnamese gang violence at the time let's just put it out there because we yeah. you know, everyone around our age we kind of remember that and it just felt so unsafe and i just remembered there was just so much like darkness and aggression and such and again my intuition my soul was telling me you have to see this and you have to experience this because you also need to learn and realize that this is not your life this is not your life. This is nobody's life. Like nobody should be experiencing that at such a young age. I mean, there were so many, again, like murders and things. It's like, it boggles my mind to go back that far in my life. Like what in the world were we thinking? And anyway, so I really felt um, constantly pulled out of it, you know, really like, and, and the thing that pulled me out of it 
was usually friends who were into music and all sorts of kind of music. Like I went down this path of like loving electronic music and dance music and like, you know, all this stuff. And so I started being pulled and followed toward this direction where there was no more violence. There was no more like weird, crazy stuff. Um, and then I got pulled into like um, indie rock and like all yeah. this stuff. And it just, it was always music that saved me, that became my refuge, you know? And that's all I cared about. And that's the thing that brought me joy. Like I just loved music so much. I do remember that. I do remember that I questioned seeing you in that, in the circle of friends that we were around. And I always questioned, I was like, that doesn't make any sense that somebody like you were hanging out in this group. Uh, Cause there's a lot of thugs that we, that we were part of that world. And I just, it really, and then you, then I remember Joel telling me that you went off to um, pursue music. And then what I thought about was, okay, it doesn't seem that she's going to go in the Paris by night route. Um, and I think I had a conversation with your mother at one point. Um, Cause I ran into her many years That's later. Hard. It's so interesting. Like to shift back into this decade, like yeah. to hear this reflection back from you. Um, because honestly, like at that time, I think to some degree, we all felt quite isolated. Like, if anything at all, like it was trying to be a part of something, mm -hmm. but everybody's going through their own stuff. That's a lot of times not talk, spoken about, you know? And so it's really, I appreciate that you're reflecting all of this back to me from like an outside perspective. Yeah. And I was always wondering, I'm like, what is she going to do with that training? Because, you know, I was really into Sarah Brightman at the time. Um, I always thought that somebody like you could take that route, but not, it didn't feel like the pop route, the Vietnamese pop route or the American Britney Spears pop route. It just didn't feel that way. And I was always curious until recently my mom, you know, a few weeks ago, my mom said, hey, you have to check this Vietnamese singer out. And I was like, oh my God, this is what happened to her. And then that's when I reached out. <laughs> and so I, um, thank, I thank you for, um, you know, coming on to spend time to for, that we can reflect on on that turbulent period and answer sort of like the the way you turned out. And I want I'm curious about how you took this journey now because uh, for me, just generally tracking people, uh, which I've kept in touch with mostly everybody in my life. I don't drop off. I just try to keep in touch with everybody and seeing your uh, progress and development up until today. Uh, I am now uh, so excited to get into, you know, your journey. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm not sure um, if we should start with the yoga or the music first, but I'll let you, you tell me. Yeah. So I think um, I'm going to start with the music because I just, again, it, music has always been, um, a refuge for me. It's always been that place of, you know, when, when you are creative, like that is, it's like this energy in all humans, this creative energy. It's because like, if you are creating something, a lot of times it's, to me, it's more of like a download. It is like a, you're, you're it's like channeling something much higher, much greater mm -hmm. than yourself to be able to put emotions, experiences, stuff that's going on in your mind, your consciousness onto paper, onto into music, onto the screen, onto a canvas. I mean, you're creating something out of not even nothing. It's out of like your world in your own mind, your own, your own experience. So I just feel like with music and art, it's really helped me to um, experience life in a completely different way. As a, even as a child, I, the first thing I was ever exposed to was the sound of music. And the, I, I just love the story because it's the initial time in my life. I was probably four or five. And my dad, he brought home the VHS of the sound of music. And if you've never seen it, it's the family of these beautiful children who sing with their, um, <clears throat> their mother and father. And I heard their voices. And I can relate to them. And it was so pure. 
their voices were so pure, so beautiful. All they wanted you to do was just like wow. imitate them, you know? And so I would, I would try to sing like them and singing like that, or in this classical form, it does something to your body. Your breath has to be connected in a certain way. Your body has to be connected completely. And I found that through the years, why I actually loved singing so much, it made me feel good. It like, it like one, probably on a scientific level, it releases a lot of good chemicals in your brain for one, right? Lots of dopamine, all of that. But on a spiritual level, it was like connecting to the divine. It was connecting to a higher source. Every time I would sing or hear beautiful music, it would just bring my mind, the consciousness to another place. And I think as my journey, I experienced that so young because I, it was absolutely going to become something really prominent in my life spiritually. Um, when I did um, continue with school, every lesson that I had, everything my teacher would tell me, you know, she would say, focus on, you know, your chest, focus on be in between your forehead, focus on your throat, this, that, that, fill your feet, fill your hips. It was exactly like a yoga lesson right. without myself ever knowing it at the time. When I started to get into yoga, just because again, it was like something I felt called to try. I felt so connected to it and it felt so familiar to me. And that familiarity could have been um, the singing, but I think the familiarity actually came from like past lives of doing this practice wow. for so many mm. lifetimes. And um, so the music, the singing and the yoga felt the same to me. And there was a period in my life when I was living in New York after I had finished school, I was living in Italy for a while and I decided to come back to the United States and, and go to New York and pursue my opera career. Um, that was when it all happened though. That's when I met my yoga teachers, my Buddhist teachers. And um, I started to sing mantra music, discovering what mantra music is. And every time I would sing and chant, it would release and open my throat. I felt so relaxed. My body was completely like in it vibrating with the sound of the mantra and i and i knew that it was like this perfect singing place so every time i would sing an aria from from an opera or a pop song <clears throat> or anything like that i wanted to get back to that place of as if i'm singing a mantra mm. and so this is why i think the spiritual practice the chanting the yoga transfers into the music and my performances I have this goal to arrive to a place of singing where I feel as if I'm chanting. Like I want to bring that same experience into everything that I sing. And I think the importance is also the listener will feel that as well. And they will actually benefit from that experience because I'm, ben I'm, I'm experiencing something deeper. And so the audience will also be able to experience something deeper. So it really becomes, it became like, it's my mission. It's like my, my, like my job in this lifetime. Right. Every time I open my mouth to think about the listener and to connect to like to a much higher place, no matter what style of music I'm singing, because then it will actually benefit the audience, you know, and it's not just a beautiful song and then it's done. When I think about yoga and the practice of singing, uh, the organic connection of mastering the breath is sort of mm. one and the same, the rhythms, the, yeah. the natural uh, side of it, because it does require mindfulness to be able to mm. dig deep into the diaphragm and bring up the breath from that area and just to see the connection that you've made. Uh, I sit here and go, of course, like that makes perfect yeah. sense. <laughs> Yay, I'm glad you see it. No, but it's true. It's, it takes mindfulness, it takes focus. And it's just as if you were meditating, and you're trying to have that one focus point, right in your meditation. Singing is, is the same. It's like, first, you have to, if you're going to sit and meditate, first, you have to like, get the body to adjust, right. and to cooperate, right? And then you're able to like, tap into the breath. 
the diaphragm, the column of the breath. And then you can focus on phonating, creating the sound and putting where the focus needs to be. Where does it need to sit in your actual physical body? Where does it need to vibrate from? So there's always like these steps that you move into and sort of the same thing with meditation. It's step by step by step. So absolutely, it takes a lot of mindfulness and a lot of focus. And it's it's so clear to me, at least, right? And I think to you too, It's a, it can be a very spiritual experience. Yeah. What were kind of the struggles that you went through um, as you were coming up when before you found out the connection uh, with the yoga? I mean, there's got to be sort of, I, I feel like a secular response to the journey um, as you were going, as you were coming up, because bef in my mind, before you get to the religious, the spiritual practice of it all, there's probably a lot of just things that you have to struggle with, uh, whether it's making the money or, oh my God, when am I going to make it? All of these things that um, our brain doesn't, you know, it's still uh, very loud um, unless you cross over to being very much. What kind of mental sort of voices did you hear um, coming up before you uh, met with your, um, your uh, yoga uh, instructor? You know, this, the question I would never have imagined, but you asking that question actually gave me goosebumps because um, I'm sort of now thinking back and reliving, because I, I, I would always say <clears throat> before I had this, like, if you want to call it this awakening, the spiritual awakening, you know, where everything just sort of like made sense. Everything just came together. The clarity was like, oh my God, I get it now. All that happened in my life was meant to happen. Mm. Everything that I experienced had to go, had to happen. So I, I totally get it. But before I had, <clears throat> excuse me, before I had that clarity, oh my God, my whole life was, I felt everything was a struggle and it wasn't an, an, a worldly struggle. There was that too. It was a, an internal mm. struggle because I didn't realize how, much I was um, um, battling against, like what my my truth was, and then all that was reflecting out my world did not match up, right? And then also this this like constant fear of um, not being good enough. Yeah. Um, um, why am I even doing that? Like I'm always like secondary. Like there's no way, you know, just not having the confidence. Um, it was such an inner struggle. And I felt like I was really unlearning. I was really unlearning so much that I had picked up along the way. Um, and that had to do with, you know, all sorts of things from our family, from the way our, the, you know, their perspective on life and all the fear that was projected onto us, which I lived with so much like resentment and anger yeah. about that until, until later I realized they were only doing what they had to do. It's right. what they were experiencing. They were showing love in this way, but we didn't understand that. But there was that. Then there was the whole adolescence years, you know, um, navigating as a young child and then a teenager. There's just so much chaos and figuring out where I belonged. And so there was so much like normal stuff, I guess, in that way. But it was a struggle because we, I think you and I, we actually saw things in life that kids nowadays, they don't experience. I'm so grateful for these new generations that they did not have to like actually experience what we experience as teenagers. Um, but I think one of my biggest things too, and I, I probably grew, was born with this aspect to work on was just insecurity of never feeling like I was ever going to make it, whatever that even meant, you know? And um, so that some, that was something that I had to work on for so long. And then when I finally had that moment of revelation, it was like, none of this is about me. Yeah, It's not for me. You know, I, I, this, these are thoughts and stuff I had to shed along the way and all the experience helped me to shed that. But it came to a point where I realized 
oh my God, it's never been about me. I'm here to serve. We are all here to serve. And if we all can kind of like tap into that nature and that mindset, there's no ego, there's no fear, there's no jealousy, there's no insecurity. It's just, I'm doing the best I can and I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot, but this is where my heart is and I'm here to serve. Like life is so precious. Life is so unpredictable. And, you know, at this point in my life, everything that I do, I want it to be toward humanity, for my family, for my community, um, for all of our like joy and awakening. You know, this may be so like esoteric and spiritual, but it's, it's just gotten to that place for me. And, you know, that brings me so much peace and so much joy. So. It's never too esoteric or too spiritual. I uh, appreciate it very much. Um, I thank you for opening up that and being uh, fearless about that description because um, it inspires um, me and it inspires, I'm sure, other people that up to the point where you kind of have a conversion, I would call it, uh, and it could be a slow conversion, it could be an instant conversion, but up until that point, there's a lot of fear that we live with, with the programming that our the previous generation has given us and left us with and it is our job almost to kind of figure that and reconfigure that uh to mm -hmm. get into a new place of consciousness so without you sharing that that would not um that would not be fine if you didn't share it you know this is <laughs> i think part of 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 your uh journey in in giving and being generous in that uh that response so thank you um that's a, a very um important thing now, when you met your yoga instructor, had you been doing yoga before? Yeah, so um, in my first year of college, I think so, you know, a long time ago, I just, I just wanted to try it. And so I went to a class and I swear to you, I wanted to throw up after <laughs> like the first class. Yeah. So like... And this, and you know, I, I'll, we can go down this, this story later about, you know, I started teaching myself for many years, but, and I would tell my students the same thing. It's okay. If you get sick after the first or second class, your body goes through so much detoxing on a physical level and on a emotional level. And so my first class, I was so sick and I was obviously purging so much of this stuff, so much of my childhood so much of my all of that that I had carried and it was just beginning to release and purge I didn't know it at the time I just felt sick <laughs> right? mm, yeah. but um so I would take courses and after that I was like family okay, try it again and then I would just take courses here and there at, at local gyms at the time we didn't have a lot of yoga studios around right. there were maybe right it was very West very side. rare to find it yeah so I would just take some classes at the local gym. And then it wasn't until um, maybe 90, no, I'm sorry, like 2003, I had um, enrolled in an in intensive opera program. And every day just so happened that we would start with yoga. And it was taught by this beautiful, beautiful mezzo soprano. Her name is Prithi Gandhi. So she was an opera singer, Indian woman, but practiced and taught yoga. So this is where I, I keep reminding myself, all of these things happen for a reason. They just sort of fall into place wow. when you're open and when you're willing. And so she came and taught yoga every single morning before we went through days and days and days and days and hours and hours of practicing singing. I felt sick all over again, over and over and over. But then there was something that would happen to me. I, I felt this like, brightness in my eyes i just felt like i could breathe better it's just there's something that kept me wanting to go back and it was this experience where merging music and yoga first ever came into my life and that's when i started to notice a little bit of that that back and forth and that familiarity and that similarity um so yeah it, it was um an amazing experience to be able to have that initially, you know, and um, yeah. <laughs> Did the 
style of um uh, the music the mantra music and the style of opera did you ever in your mind feel like oh my god like the two things are so different and they might be clashing or uh you know it might not work out in a way that you were envisioned yeah um i think i i was always the a kind of person that would would try something new and i, I kind of like i saw an idea and i would try it and my whole life actually one other thing i struggled with was i always wanted to do something different and try something new and it was not just to be different it was just i was in i was curious i was in awe about you know different music and experiences and one thing that i did struggle with was out of all things i'm not doing the britney spears thing i'm not technically doing the sarah brightman thing i went into like opera and then mantra music these two things that so many people don't either know much about or they don't really have an opportunity to experience mm -hmm. and so especially coming back into the vietnamese community at some point and sharing music i i shared with the community yoga and mantra and classical music it always felt so odd because i knew it was something that people were not used to you know um and both of them again yes they're different from one another but to me the experience of singing both it felt the same uh. um the only difference the only difference was i started to become more conscious of the secular stuff that i wanted to sing i started to pick and choose certain repertoire certain songs that i felt like this doesn't really inspire me and i don't think it's really inspiring other people on a soul level so i only wanted to sing things that had some depth to it and some meaning and purpose behind it or some benefit behind it um so no matter what at some point i i kind of like made a choice i made a choice of how i wanted to um share and offer my my love of music with the world at some point did the idea of money or sort of commercial viability pop up because i mean opera is is a very limited um it's a very limited uh, form for people to get into because it's not everybody can really get into it and then if you take it to mantra yeah. yeah well i mean opera compared to mantra music is much more commercial right i mean in my mind but when you go from opera to, to mantra i mean so did financial incentives ever come into it for you? Always. I mean, it was, it was, you know, um, I lived my life very simply and um, I was really happy actually. Like, I think every day I was like, I'm so lucky to have gotten this download. I, I just felt that I wasn't a slave to the human ego, human mind anymore. And that to me was like such freedom that, you know, a span of my life, I just didn't really care or think too much about money of like a source of happiness because I was so at peace and so content, sort of living very bohemian-ish and very hippie-ish and very right. simple. And my friends and community, we were all just sort of basking in this place of consciousness and the material world didn't really it wasn't an, of an importance at the time and you know then came a point in my life where i was like okay there's so much more that i want to do with my skill in music with the voice i you know but i knew that i would have to take a new step in life that i couldn't continue to sort of live this very safe um, bohemian lifestyle, you know, but it was so beautiful just being in this like spiritual community constantly and, and again, feeling very safe. But there was a point where I knew that I had to be of more of use in this world as well and kind of, re you know, leave my comfort zone and go out into the world more. And it was probably the spiritual maturity at some point you you do mature and think okay well i have this this little bit of wisdom a skill and now i need to use it i can't just sit around and like hide from the world for the rest of my life 
And um, so, yeah, like I, I had to come out and be a part of the world and share all of these aspects and find ways to actually make it happen and survive, you know, then, then money became an issue because like, I need to put an album out. Well, how am I going to do that? I need a producer. Well, how am I going to pay for a producer? I need to work with musicians, but I, they can't work for free. You know, um, now I have like, I'm on my own. I need to pay for rent. I have utilities that normal life stuff to take care of. And I'm not getting, I'm not comfortable anymore of just getting by as well. And I know that for me personally, I can, I can do so much more if I'm in a stable situation. So all of these things like kind of starts to make sense. You know, it's another like passing, another phase of my life, another rebirth. It's like a total other rebirth um, of integrating the spiritual world into the material world. And yeah, so then, then the struggle became real. And, but then the drive and the vision and the hope also became very real. And the trusting of life, trusting in God, trusting in the universe, trusting in my higher self became real and learning to manifest, you know? Um, and so eventually, yeah, I, I had to find a way to actually survive and make things really happen. Yeah. Can you share that with me? Um, like, what was the first building block? Uh, where, you know, once you had that revelation, when did it begin and how did it begin? Yeah, so um, everyone is different, but my thing that I had to unlearn, um, and it came from this very stubborn, I'm a Capricorn, I'm a, you know, I'm self-sufficient, I will figure it out. It came to a point where I was um, faced with, you know, I never like to ask for help. I never want anyone to do anything for me. I will handle this all on my own to, this is a point in my life now on a professional front that I need to get some help. I need to get support to be able to grow and move forward. So it was really about allowing myself to finally say, I am going to go out in the world and actually ask for support to be able to do my work, to be able to do my art. And that's something that was so challenging all my life. Even my um, my vocal teacher's husband, who was in a &R, um, helping artists to develop their careers, he would say to me after every voice lesson, it's like, why are you so stubborn? How come you never want anyone to help you? And I didn't really realize that that was such a strong um, character that came through. And it, it stuck in my head. And so I kind of like, I got to a point where I realized it's true. I never ask for help. I never want anyone to help me. And it's an ego thing. It's mm. a fear of like giving too much power away or something. Yeah. You know? And um, then I said, screw this. I'm done with that. I'm going to let go of that. I'm going to work on that. And so I put it out there and I said, okay, this next project, I'm asking the universe that you know, something shifts, something happens, a miracle happens that I'll be able to create this very first album um, that is so essential in my path, in my career. And maybe it took about a year when it all finally came together, when the right people, the right investors, the right team, they just started kind of like showing up wow. you know, and things kind of fell into place. But I believe that if you're not clear with what you want and you're not you don't speak it out loud and you don't like nitpick on the details. You, you don't get all of those things. Like it becomes sort of like wishy-washy, but we have to be so clear in what we want. It's you really know? about setting intentions. Setting intentions. Yep. And this is how we can manifest. And it first starts with the intention and then the clarity of what that all looks like for you. Do you know much about yeah. ayahuasca by any chance? I do know much about ayahuasca. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're like, I do know but, much about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but honestly, I've actually, so, you know, my community of friends that I've, I've known for, for a couple decades now, we've all gone through these like paths and experiences, but I have to say, I've never done it. I've never, we say you will be called 
to experience it when, when you're called, it's not something that you just say, okay, I want to do it. But the, the medicine itself calls you and you, you'll feel so like pulled and, and eager and want to experience it. And I just haven't ever yeah. had that. And I, I can tell you why later, but yeah, I just, but no. it's like but your I know language, that it's very your language beneficial. is, your language is all, uh, sounds like it comes from that community. Um, the way you it, it just described the does? last. Say again. And, and I think it probably does because this, the community is a conscious community. You know, most people have done some large amount of uh, meditation and yes. yoga and, and inner work themselves. And then there comes a point where something like ayahuasca launches you a little deeper, a little further, you know, when there's a block that you just can't seem to surpass. Ay ayahuasca or, you know, even mushrooms can help you to sort of like, boom, just kind of break through walls, you know, um, and it can really show and give you a lot of um, clarity. And yeah, yeah so I, mean, I never did ayahuasca. The way you I, describe uh, the yoga is very similar to purging and very similar yeah. to the awakening and um, healing. And then you moved into the whole intention setting with that one year that it took to assemble the the Avengers team for yourself. And it sounds yeah. very, yeah, like that journey. Well, yeah, I think all of the spiritual work is that no matter what we're doing, it, think of it as like a glass of water that maybe have like, has like dirt and it just say a glass of mud, not even this clear. And if you keep pouring, 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 it starts to stir up all the stuff that's in there. So this is our purging moment. And there's so many ways that you right. can experience that. And it could be through yoga, it could be through meditation, it could be through plant medicine. You know, it could be just, I don't know, one day, like something happens, but eventually like we get all the gross stuff at the bottom, it floats to the top and then the water becomes clear. So the purging can happen in so many different ways and styles and forms and techniques and, and paths. Um, for some people, plant medicine that really worked for them. And, um, you know, I, the reason why I was laughing about all of that was because when I was younger, and I don't even know if you knew this side of me, I sort of left in high school, the whole Vietnamese, that whole craziness. And I started experimenting with LSD. I did not know. And ecstasy. Yeah. And nobody, most people don't, which is, I think it's kind of cute. It's kind of funny, but you know, um, and it wasn't ever about wanting to get high, wanting to just like lose myself and whatever. It actually was at some point became like, I would have a notebook and a pen with me every time because I just wanted to like, like transcribe these downloads that I was getting. And um, one of my very last times of experiencing LSD, I had this moment of connecting to what we always talk about, like of oneness, mm -hmm. connecting to God. Like there was no separation between me and everything and all my thoughts and emotions and feelings and physical anything. So like that was the very last time I ever took anything. And I just felt like I didn't need to anymore. Right. I got this like glimpse, a glimpse of what we're trying to experience in meditation and in plant medicine and things. And so for me, I just never felt called to do anything ever again. Like that information is what will ever forever be with right. me, you know? Um, so I, it's, yeah, I mean, it's all, really beautiful and powerful when used with intention and purpose really technical side to the spirituality if you think about it you have to be led yeah. into it and explained uh the technique yes and you have to be um led into it by the right people you know and have the right guidance and have the right teachers i think this is a really important part of it. Um, there's a lot of diluted information out there. 
um, spirituality consciousness has become so mainstream. And then we know what happens when it becomes mainstream. Like it's just becomes kind of strange, like good things, bad things, a mix of everything. Um, so we do have to really um, check and pick and choose and make sure that, you know, it, it, you, we qualify everything, you know, and see what works for, for us. Can we talk about your name change? Yes. <laughs> so um, my husband jokes with me all the time and he's like, how come you have so many names? Right? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. I was born Mai Sun Lan. So my Vietnamese name is Mai Sun Lan, last name Mai. And then um, growing up, I hated how people pronounce my name Lan because it's spelled L-O-A-N. Mm -hmm. So everyone would say Lone. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, no. Then I took my Catholic name, my baptismal name, which is Teresa, which I lived with for so many, so many years. And then um, I became a Kundalini yoga teacher at, in 2011. And um, you have a choice to take a spiritual name or not. And if you do want one, there's someone who, you know, sits and meditates, look at your astrology and you know, it just kind of tunes into you and then boom, like gives you this name. So the name that she gave to me is Sangeeta Kar. And in Kundalini Yoga, it, it's, um, it's some of it is pulled from the tradition of Sikhism. And so in Sikhism, all the men, their last name is Singh and all the women, their last name is Kar. And so if you're given a name as a woman, it's going to be Kar no matter what. Oh, wow. And so Sangeeta, I lived with that. I meditated with it for about a year before I actually used it because it was so odd to like adopt this new name and you really had to identify yourself with it first. And I didn't quite yet. I wasn't ready to let go of Teresa, my, you know. And the meaning of Sangeeta Kar is um, music of princess and harmony in which then serves God. And our names are so important. Like anything that they call you, the meaning of your name, it's like it vibrates and it penetrates into your aura right. and your entire field. And so, you know what, eventually about a year later, I was like, I think I'm ready. I'm ready to live this destiny that through my music, through the music that I share with the world, it's for greater good. It's to serve the universe, it's to serve humanity. I'm ready to live this destiny name now. And so I chose Sangeeta Kar ever since. And how is it? And, felt I, and I still reply to Teresa Mai. I still reply to Lon. I still reply to whatever anybody wants to call me. I, I still honor all of my names because it's all a part of who I am. And, and how have you felt um, since the change? Uh, I guess my, my question is, do you feel more in line with the calling or has it been a struggle to sort of, you know, balance the, the, the plane, if you will, you know, like the wings are, or is it just a straight shot and it's smooth? Yeah, I think once I decided it was a straight shot, the whole like balancing part yeah. was, am I ready? Is this for me? Is this me? Do I feel connected to it? So I went past that already before I actually said, this mm. is it. This is my destiny. This is what I choose for the rest of my life. This is what I choose to do in my life. I want to live by this name, which helps to elevate that choice. That's sort of like, yeah. you know, um, monks or, you know, priests in different religions when they convert over to the vow of um, that lifelong mm -hmm. vow of becoming that or going on that road, they have a name change. And that I think that really releases them from the previous uh, way of existing yeah. to be to have the new mindset exactly you said it just right it's um it's an it's an old part of you that you're releasing um when i think of Teresa Mai, oh gosh i i think of decades and years of so many different experiences in life that they are they will always be a part of me i will always be grateful for every bit of it at the same time i'm like that's no longer her who I am, you know, um, I've, I've grown so much from all of that. And the responsibility now that I want to take is completely different. And the vibration is completely different. And so it just, it felt so right, you know. 
I have a bias towards new religion and old religions. I really uh, enjoy ancient uh, ideas of the formation of the universe or the formation of men, or women, and humanity. Uh, and I feel like the new stuff, sort of, you know, Christian, Judeo Christian, Catholicism, uh, are all, I guess they're just, the, 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 these tools, if you will, are blemished because of wars and colonialism and all that and the ancient text of you know hinduism buddhism uh speak a little bit more clear to me because they just seem to be tested time tested and throughout the centuries they just seem to universally make sense now um is that something that your world mom dad culture because it sounds like you were raised catholic is that something that comes up internally as a struggle for you? Um, maybe a long time ago mm. it did because, you know, my mom's side of the family, they're totally super, super, super devout Catholics. Um, and it's, there's always that idea of, oh God, if you go against the church, you're going to go to hell, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, all, all of that you, it's kind of like goes down the line with that. And so, that sat in my subconscious and my conscience like for a long time um and i kind of had to hide like yeah. my new discoveries you know i i even want to share one story i remember when i was living in new york and you know this is when it all sort of happened for me when it was like a big thing that shifted and i had set this really small altar in my room with a, a small canvas of the green tara and just an incense and a candle. And my poor mom, I love you, mom, if you're watching this, she came to visit me and she saw this little altar in my room. She never said a word. Once she left, maybe a day or two later, Joe calls me, my brother calls me. He's like, what's going on? I'm like, what do you mean? Mom says you're like in some sort of cult or something. And Oh, so no. typical. I don't even think Joe remembers this, but it will always be in my memory because I'm like, oh my gosh, this is actually bringing me so much peace. But I understand that not everyone can understand that. So the only struggle that I can say I had was like letting my family know, look, I may be practicing something different from you. I know how deeply your heart is for God, mm. your God and the way that you see God. But I honestly, I don't feel our passion and our fire in our heart is any different. And I had this conversation with my Bawai, my grandma, who is the head of my mother's side of the family, who is super Catholic. She's an absolute saint in her own right. She would have been the one to, because every time I'd see her, she'll say, do you have a boyfriend? Is he Catholic? Um, are you going to church every Sunday? But when I had this spiritual conversation with the wife, I remember very clearly, she turns to me and says, I had no idea, God, you are closer to God than anybody in the family that I know. And even if you don't do it the same way as we do, I'm, I'm wow. so surprise and that was huge for me because she understood you know like we found that that union in love with spirituality and with god in our own way and that like common understanding and so beautiful progressive um, yeah so progressive for my little old mom <laughs> um so that was a really turning key turn key moment for me um and from beyond that really it's it was so it was so clear to me that there was just no other direction and the whole thing going back with like religion and dogma and all of this stuff in every religion that we know of it's there's always something messy something sticky and sometimes i believe even with catholicism it's the humans that kind of mess okay. things up mm -hmm. it's the human ego that messed it up it's not always the the practice or the belief in itself because i actually believe that jesus was real 
And he was actually an absolute saint, a sage, and probably even a yogi. Yes, I, I you know? really do and, believe that. And he kind of showed up mm -hmm. at the right time, right place. And then he was sort of claimed as belonging to a certain religion. Um, but that wasn't really the thing. Like he was a true saint, a true enlightened being. Well, there's yeah. this theory that he disappeared for, you know, when he was 12 or 13 to 30 years old. And, you know, people wonder where he went. And, you know, the teachings that come out of him sound very Buddhist. And very the, walk, Buddhist. the walk wasn't that far, I, I hear, um, a few hundred miles or something into India or crossing over into some some place like that. But if you think about all the things that were uttered um, or written about what he uttered, it's there's nothing really there that you can say, no, that doesn't make sense because it really goes back to God is love. And if you treat your neighbors and you treat humans with love, that's all that really matters. I mean, you go back yeah. to the Old Testament with the, um, you know, they're still recovering from brutality and they're still recovering from, you know, human history of just just utter brutalness. And I think the or, Old Testament, yeah. yeah, is a little bit more shaky in terms of morality and ethics. But when you get to the New Testament with Jesus Christ, I think it's just much more um, inflated with love and that message of, you know, turning the other cheek and just doing right uh, uh, yeah. with, with humans. It, it all makes sense in a Buddhist context or um, ancient context to me. Yeah, it's very much more universal. Yes. Um, and actually, um, there are some books out there that compare or talk about Jesus being a yogi and sort of comparing these paths and exactly what you're saying, the words that he had said and how it relates so much to this, um, this Buddhist or Eastern philosophy. It's I mean, to me, I have had dreams with Jesus and I'm not a practicing Catholic, but I have so much respect for the beauty in that religion, all the pure parts of it. For me, that's what I look for in any organized religion is what's real, what is true and what do I find true? What do I want to take away that feels true for me? You know, and it's just there's this, this, I, I don't dislike any religion. It's just more, again, it's the humans that tainted all of this beautiful, right. these beautiful practices, you know, and, you know, I have been told many, many times by teachers that when we start to lessen identifying ourselves with one religion, we're evolving more mm. and more where our consciousness is evolving because we start to realize we're not that thing or just this one thing. If, if we're truly coming to that place of enlightenment, we will realize that we are everything, all the good, all the bad, all the beautiful, all the ugly, all the, the chaos, the, even today, the political mess, all of these things is a part of our consciousness in some way or another. It's a mirror and it's purging. So things that you don't identify yourself with that you may seem like this is horrific. I would never, even though you're seeing it, it's your mind purging it. It's not you, but you're purging. It was a part of you at some point. We've lived infinite lifetimes. How can we have not been the worst and the best? Right. You know? And I feel like that is the whole point of the first question is what does it mean to be Vietnamese? Because that is an infinite answer. And we are both Vietnamese, but we are also everything because that answer throughout the podcast so far has been everything. So in that question, I, I kind of want to hear, I kind of want to prove, I kind of want to keep it open. I kind of want to disprove. I kind of want to just show and hear and listen and learn how similar, but yet how different and how we are just all sharing a journey of humanity. And the more we get to hear that, I think the more we can take um, solace in understanding that uh, we are part of this human journey by being part of the subgroup of being Vietnamese. 
and it's not yeah. that we can't take nationalism uh, so seriously that we're going to war with other people and that's the exact opposite i think of what what exactly. i'd like to see in the world yeah i mean we have to remind ourselves that we are all different we have all experienced completely different histories we're all carrying so much of our history of our ancestors right. And all, there's not one culture that I can't say is not carrying their ancestors stuff. It, it doesn't leave us. I mean, one thing I do understand being Vietnamese, like, okay, I could have been born a Caucasian. I could have been born a Latina. I could have been born African-American woman, but I was born a Vietnamese woman. And so what, why is mm. it so karm Like if you talk about karma, karmically, that's such a obvious, like, it's not something that's just internal it's on the outside like i am a vietnamese woman and so the, also like i felt what there must be a reason for that too and that's why when you reached out to me for this interview i was like i can finally express wow. myself to our community as well you know the experience this journey that i've so blessedly been able to experience and still coming out like proud to be where I'm at and who I am and wanting to even you know continue to serve our community and to and to really know like there's a reason for all of that and we and we need to come together and I think as Vietnamese we haven't quite 100% yet um, but there's time and there's still hope for that you know um, and I think maybe that's one part of our mission in this life as Vietnamese people to keep promoting that, to keep putting it out there, that look, we are one. We need to find that place to reconnect yes. our love, you know? You, um, you know, I, um, you know, as I was reading about your life and work, um, your husband, uh, I, Hi Win, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. He showed up and, you know, I didn't have time to, to dig in, but I did want to, on this episode, highlight, because I think he is also a musician and he's Vietnamese and, I wanted to, you know, take a little bit of time to talk about him, if you're okay and comfortable with that. I want to know a little sure. bit more about him, and I want to hear because it sounds like he has a lot of influence in your work, and um, I'm mm -hmm. really curious about who he is and you know what he's all about. Yeah, he's um, okay. It's kind of funny because I remember growing up, and I'm like. I've had one Vietnamese boyfriend. I will never date Vietnamese again. I just thought in my head, like, I would never date Vietnamese. <laughs> and I never did. And it, it wasn't because I wasn't interested. I just felt there was like no connection anymore. I became so like far right. stretched out that I just, there was no connection. So in my mind, I never thought I would end up with a Vietnamese person. And then when he came along, I remember people saying, oh, I think he has a crush on you. Da, 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 da. I'm like, no, 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 no. In my head, I'm like, no, he's Vietnamese. I don't think it's going to work out. <laughs> but why it worked out was this. He's a Vietnamese man who was born and raised in Vietnam, left Vietnam for school in 73. He's much older than me. He's kind of like a big kid too. He left Vietnam in 73 for school. So he actually missed the whole situation, fall of Saigon in 75. He was here in the US, um, only hearing about potentially his family had left, but didn't know where they were. Um, he was here with his old elves, one of his older brothers. So the two of them, you know, left before 75. So that already to me, I feel like um, he didn't get scarred like, mm most other Vietnamese people. He was scarred because there was fear of where his mother was, his family, his siblings, but he himself wasn't a boat person. He didn't have to travel in that way. That was such a blessing for him, I believe. Um, he spent the next 20 years in the US um, studying and he spent most of this time in Texas and he studied as in uh, petroleum engineering. So he was actually an engineer for most of his life. Um, and then all I do know is that since he was a kid, he loved music. He played, he self-taught himself how to play the classical guitar. And, um, one day his mom, rest her soul, <laughs> said, 
said, you are not going down the route of a musician and took his guitar and just smashed it. Wow. And that was sort of like the end of his hopes and dreams as ever becoming a musician. Um, he pursued his life in engineering, did an amazing, had a successful um, career for himself. He left the US after his 20 years of studying and working, then went back to Vietnam. Wow. With, with the very little money that he was able to save up, um, had an American partner who had really nothing but a lot of skill, right? He had a lot of skill and intelligence, but the two of them had barely anything. And they both went back to Vietnam and was able to meet and talk to the prime minister, to the heads of Vietnam at the time to convince them to let him become the next, um, to drill the next wells and um, get oil in Vietnam. Da, da, da. Long story short, with his this incredible career path that he had and all of the influences and his partner in the US who really, um, they had, and I love this so much, they had one paper, an agreement of their partnership, handwritten and then hand signed and a handshake deal until the day they started the company till the day hi left the company that handshake deal always remained and it's just something that you don't ever see anymore it's now it's like you gotta go to your lawyers you have this you have this clause you have that these two guys were dreamers hard workers um and they just, they knew once they put their head into something that they believed in, it was gonna become something. And they never looked back, they never gave up. Even though drilling oil is not an easy thing, it's a risk, every day is a risk. But they persevered, um, he did, he had a successful turnout with that. Along the way, helped so many people. He's such a generous soul, he would, you know, it's for him money was never it never depicted who he was or is it, money was a source of energy and a way for him to actually help other people and it was it's just so beautiful until this day so so he spent 20 years there then came back again to the U.S. and then that's when he and I met and yes he became a source of inspiration for me as a businesswoman and how to kind of run my whole thing um he's just been an incredible teacher and an incredible supporter of my music and my mission um and him being such a highly self-trained classical musician and singer he has the ear he has the eye for he's so intuitive um of what is true talent and what is true skill and who really like needs that support too like he's so supportive of artists it's really really beautiful um, and he's the kind of person who's anytime he believes in giving something, he never expects anything back, Right. you know, and he's always lived his life this way. And I think that that's why his success came was because it was never about him. It was about the community that he was with. And it was a communal effort to make success happen. You know, till this day, he'll get emails from some of his or, um, former employees saying thank you so much everything that i learned from the company and now i'm doing this and i'm here because it, you know so it's it's really beautiful and i feel like even for me we've been together for seven years and i'm still learning more and more about how his mind works um and how he how he works with people and in community he says i'm retired i'm so done i don't want to work i just want to play music all day <laughs> so you know, only when it's necessary. Oh, I will get my business lesson 101 with him, <laughs> like anytime. And, you know, he's helped me to become even more fearless. He's had to deal with the top and top and heads of heads of this and this. And so for him meeting anyone, it's no big deal for him. So he looks at me like, what's the big deal if you want to go meet Oprah? It's just Oprah. She's incredible, but you just have to like call and make it happen. You know, for him, like things like that, it's not, there's never an excuse to not make it happen. He's fearless and, and, but he's heartful, you know, um, he's just a wonderful human being. And this is why it worked out. All the experiences in his life made his mind so vast. 
so cultured, so um, open. And that's where we, we related deeply was that we can share like openness in life and the world, world views perspectives. We, we, we share so much of the similarity. And he didn't grow up being such a spiritual guy, but since we've met, he's been so open. And I do see the, the past life in him. Like I feel that in him, that he was a very spiritual person in many lifetimes before, because everything we talk about, he just sort of gets it. You know, and he has so much um, respect for for it all. It's really beautiful. And again, I, I feel like I'm still learning about him every day. You know, and it's it's wonderful. I appreciate you sharing. Um, I was hoping to hear that. I was hoping to hear the expansiveness because he seems like it. Just the pictures and you know the way know. that he's integrated into your life. That I had to ask, and I, I, I <laughs> this is the first time I've ever asked anybody about their spouse, but. <laughs> He just seems it's okay. Like I, love, I love talking about him. He's, he's amazing. And you know what's funny? It's not funny. It is funny. It's not. So he really, if he ever did pursue a music career, he would have been a superstar mm. because his charisma and his fearlessness on stage it is so, he's such a natural and he draws like, he'll just walk on stage and open his mouth for one note and it just sort of like sucks the attention. Like there's something in his voice and his presence that's so strong. If he ever would have pursued a music career, he would have, I'm so certain he would have gone really far with it. So I think in a way too, he lives through me vicariously now too. And he sees where I'm going in my career and it makes him so happy and excited. Every time I achieve something, he wants to celebrate so hugely because I feel like he's celebrating for an achievement that we've done together. Wow. Everything that I accomplish, he's accomplishing with me. You know, so it's a celebration for the both of us. It's 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 really beyond words of special. I read that yeah. you both are um putting together a project, uh, a symphony um of, of brick and mortar location in seal beach yes yes um oh my god there's so much going on this could be like a whole nother conversation so yes um we have a friend chad um berlinghieri who i knew since a long time ago and we were both singers chad is such a hard worker and he started seal beach symphony well he started the idea of it and because we saw his work ethics and his vision and he's such a go-getter for hi, he just he sees the talent. He see he wants to see people who like can really pull it off, who have the stamina, who have the will, who have the strength um, and the vision. And for him, if he sees that and he believes in something, you know, he's like, we have to help. So um, before COVID pandemic shut everyone down, we had become their first major donors to get Seal Beach Symphony up and going. And then two years of doing nothing, but this is the first year we're finally back and they're, we're doing a concert actually this Saturday on the 12th for Valentine's. Um, so now Seal Beach Symphony can live on and have a life and you know do amazing things. So we're really excited for them. That's amazing. So amazing. Yeah. Have you been to Vietnam? I have two times. Um, the first time was in the late 90s. And I went back to visit my half brother um, that I never met before. That was the first time we spent a week and that was it. And I don't remember much except jumping on his moped and he would take me somewhere new so we can oh. sit and just talk and get to know each other. And that was a really special time. Um, the second time was in 2015 and I went to teach yoga in Thailand. And then I stopped over in Vietnam to visit my grandpa and the family there and spent a week. And that was it between Saigon and Hanoi teaching yoga and meditation and visiting family. Um, will you, so will you ever I've been there, but I don't know why. Hmm. Will you ever perform, think of performing in Vietnam? Um, I've been asked this over and over and yes, I'm ready. I really want to um, do something bigger in Vietnam. I think that people are really open to everything I do now. Um, and I think, 
very soon in the next year or two years, I'll definitely do some sort of concert or tour um, throughout Asia, but then um, definitely be in Vietnam. And I just want to know Vietnam more. I know it's changed so much. Like I wasn't born there, but I've seen videos all my life, you know, VHSs that people with family members would come home. And I only know it through talking and watching, but I, I really want to go back there and spend a lot of time um, and get to know Vietnam more, even though now it's just so different, but still, um, I think of the, the beauty and the, the history will always, always be there. Well, I hope that in the next few years, you get to experience that and then come back and we can share your thoughts on that. Um, thank you so much today. That. You know, I, you know, the, the conversation was far beyond what I thought it would be. Although I prep for this stuff, you can never tell or know ahead of time how these things turn out. And I am so blessed that we got to talk about things and the clarity that you come with um, from the experiences uh, that you've had in your life is um, just phenomenal, unbelievable. Thank you so much. And I am so grateful um, to be able to have this conversation with you. It's not easy. There's so much I want to say all the time when I do interviews, but they're always in Vietnamese. And, you know, being American born, I like struggle, but I try yeah. my best, but I could never really convey everything that I would like to say. So I just, I'm so grateful to be able to use these words and <laughs> to be able to express them um, to you and to be able to share with our community and I'm just really proud of what you're doing as well. And, and so honored to be able to sit here and chat in this way. Likewise, and I do hope that we get to, um, throughout the next few years, we get to come back and you know revisit these sort of ideas and um, conversation. Yes, for sure. Let's please make it happen. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran. Special thanks to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcasts. Thanks again for listening.